Throughout Earth's vast expanses of water, some of the most remarkable species exist, many of which are undiscovered, shrouded in mystery, deep below the surface. One particular fish species continues to leave the world in awe. However, they are heavily misunderstood, eaten, or simply hunted for sport. Humans have turned their backs on a species which in truth are far more than the bloodthirsty predators we have been led to believe. And these types of fish are known across the world as sharks. Going back around 380 million years to what was known as the Devonian period, the first shark species was known as the Cladoscalachi, though it is also speculated that this was a type of chimera due to its anatomy consisting of cartilage. I guess for many, many, many years, I was really into sharks. What I wanted to do was basically save sharks. I became aware in the 1980s of the incredible threat the world's shark populations were facing, mainly due to finning and overfishing. So for 30 odd years, I was sort of a shark crusader. When I was eight years old, I was sent out from UK, uh, where I was at prep school, boarding school, to Kuwait. And all I wanted to do was go swimming because it was Easter and it was Easter time here, so not warm, but really warm in Kuwait in the Gulf. And I got there and my mother said, no swimming outside our house because there had been a shark attack. I mean, how exciting is that to an eight year old? So I was really disappointed I couldn't go swimming and I spent virtually the whole of that Easter holiday sitting on the garden wall, waiting for a fin to go like that and hoping there would be someone in the water. I mean, that's pretty bizarre, but it's kind of the way small boys are, you know? It never happened. So I was literally hooked on sharks and still am. Though sharks do not possess bones, they can still fossilize, resulting in the spectacular condition of their skeletons and teeth, which remain in museums today. As sharks age, calcium salts are deposited into their skeletal cartilage to strengthen them. The jaws of a shark are so solid, one might confuse them for bone. The skeletal structure allows the shark to remain light and their large livers are filled with low-density oils, which allows them to keep buoyant in the ocean. The curious thing about sharks is that, although they've evolved massively in some ways, they're a perfectly evolved animal, which is why they've survived. They are an incredible animal in the sense that, that they're perfect. You know, we've got our senses, touch, smell, taste, etc. They've got our senses plus one. And if you think about them swimming through the water, um, they look like a fighter plane. So they look like the wings out there, you know, and the tail fit wing up there, and, and they're this thing, and, and they're covered in little teeth. The body is covered in little teeth called dermal denticles. This means they've got very, very, very little resistance going through the water. They can swim, you know, effortlessly. If you watch them, it's just a very chilled out thing until something makes them do something different. If one was to determine the age of a shark, their vertebrae would need to be examined. The vertebrae contain pairs of translucent and opaque bends, which can be counted as though counting the rings of a tree. Scientists have discovered the method may be inaccurate due to the varying nature of the shark's size and species. This inaccuracy led to a new study on deposition rate, indicating the quantity of bands produced are in accordance with each species and size class. By validating the deposition rate, the age of a shark can be calculated with more accuracy. During the Devonian period, the ocean was swarming with ancient marine animals, such as ammonioids, an extinct form of mollusk. The trilobites, an ancient ancestor of crabs known as arthropods, were steadily declining, likely due to their inefficient anatomy. 
abundant fossil remains show that the trilobites had segmented bodies and simple jointed appendages similar to modern crustaceans. It was clear to see that the new age of marine life was on the horizon. Species were evolving to ensure their survival. Sharks, in particular, would find themselves in a very dominant position. Towards the end of the Devonian period, came an extinction event so devastating that it had wiped out 75% of the Earth's species. Global temperatures had reached a height so severe that the mixing rate of the oceans had altered between the surface and lower layers. The bottom waters experienced a low reoxygenation rate, leading to the death of many ocean species. We've been here five minutes, 200,000 years actually. And the way we're going, we're going to be very lucky to be here another few hundred, let alone 100,000. So the sharks have been here forever, and, and we're just a, a teeny little weeny blip. And I suspect they'll be here when we're gone. The Carboniferous period had begun and is now widely known to be the golden age for sharks. The golden age not only set sharks as dominant predators in the ocean, but it also gave birth to many variants of shark. The Stethacanthus is one of the stranger types to roam the sea. Evolving from the Chimera lineage, this particular shark developed a distinctive anvil-shaped fin on its back. By the end of the Golden Age, the seas were swarming in a presumed 45 different shark families. From the harsh temperature change during the Permian-Triassic period to the alleged meteorite which killed the dinosaurs in the Jurassic period, it is clear that sharks have stood the test of time. The shark species have miraculously survived five major extinction events. Although a contributing factor, this wasn't just due to the sheer hardiness and durability of the fish. Sharks are malleable. Their ability to survive lies in their exploration of different parts of the water column, from the shallow waters to the deep, dark oceans, and even rivers. Their diet is also vast. Sharks will feed on something as small as plankton to prey as large as whales. Their diversity has also played a massive part. Whilst many species of shark have gone extinct, such as the Stethacanthus, the notorious Megalodon, many have evolved to survive, requiring far less food in order to sustain themselves, unlike their giant ancestors. Megalodon, so 15 meters worth of fish weighing up to 10 elephants worth, 50 tons, and a mouth two meters wide. I mean, it's a good job this guy isn't around, it really is. And teeth about 20 centimeters. The white shark is kind of like a mini megalodon. Um, science thinks that white sharks are descended from the same sort of branch of, of, of ancestry. But yeah, what a fish that was. You can actually buy fossil teeth. They probably, big ones would be about 20 meters, top to bottom, big fish, big teeth, to be avoided. I don't like to think of things extinct, but I'm kind of glad they're extinct, actually. The anatomy of a shark naturally varies depending on the biology of their predecessors. The hammerhead shark, for instance, one of the youngest families in our ocean today, is estimated to have evolved from a Karcharnid ancestor, also known as a requiem shark. It was surmised that the iconic hammer-shaped head was the result of the head gradually expanding over millions of years. The great white shark, simply known as white shark, has a remarkable anatomy. Their species are classically shaped with a pointed snout, a triangular dorsal fin, and a crescent-shaped caudal fin. Each white shark is unique and identifiable by the color of their flanks ranging from very pale undersides to a grayish black. This also allows them to view their prey from above, disguising themselves with the pale sky. The nostrils of the white shark are on the underside of the snout and lead to an organ called the olfactory bulb. The white shark is reported to possess the largest olfactory bulb of any shark species. This is likely the cause of many exaggerated rumors regarding the great white's sense of smell. Whilst their scent is incredible, sharks cannot smell a drop of blood from a mile away, as many have proclaimed. 
sense travel to the great white as they do any living being through particles, in this case, carried by the ocean current. The great white shark is a temperate seas animal, so it's really, really widespread. It can take anything, I believe, from one degree, it's been clocked going down to one degree, but normally five or six degrees up to about 25 degrees, which means a vast band of the world's oceans. If you want to go and see a great white shark, then South Africa, was a good place until they went to war with orcas. Um, South Australia is a good place, New Zealand's a good place, California's a good place, New England's a good place, anywhere in that sort of temperate band of oceans around the world. And I would say to anybody, don't be worried, you know, go and see a great white shark. It's gonna be an experience, it's gonna blow you away. I was working long time ago on basking sharks with an American photographer, a very famous one at the time, called Jeff Rotman. And Jeff said, Richard, the first time you see a white shark underwater, it blows you away, it's indescribable. About three years later, I was in the water in a cage in South Africa, and my first white shark swam up to me, right, right, right up to the cage. Reasonable sized animal, probably about four meters. And Jeff was right. There aren't any words, there's absolutely nothing to describe what you feel when that amazing creature is just sort of, you know, just, just coming up to say hello. In those days, this is a few years ago now, we weren't just in cages. I mean, you know, it was a bit get the t-shirt, get the tattoo, go outside the cage, which was actually a bit stupid and bonkers. We all decided to go free diving anyway. You're in a cage and this thing comes up to you. In a way, the thing that worried me most, because I was leading a team out there to do that, was the very fact that it wasn't frightening. It was kind of spellbinding. It was, it was extraordinary. It was a, an amazing experience. And you almost wanted to reach out, and some people did. And as the shark went by, you almost wanted to stroke it. Now, that may sound absolutely bonkers, but it's true. And people were. And I could see from up on the deck um, the guys looking down. And one guy had his, um, his breather taken out of his mouth because he had done that. And they wanted him up there to tell him off pretty quickly because that is bonkers. You know, start sticking bits of your body outside. You're, you're asking for trouble. But you've got this incredible animal. You're inches away if you're lucky. Uh, and and there's, no, there's no feeling of aggression. There really is no feeling of threat. There's just a feeling of total awe. The Great White Shark is this sort of extraordinary fighter aircraft swimming through the water at you, and it's, the technical word is it's spindle-shaped. It's, it's actually a solid tube of muscle uh, held together, if you like, by, uh, by the cartilage. It's called cartilaginous, and, and that helps it with its speed. It makes it lighter, so it's, got not, it's not a bony structure. Help, help, that helps it keep afloat. On the shark's snout, you will find electroreceptors known as ampullae of Lorenzini. Many consider this to be the source of a shark's sixth sense. By sensing electric fields emitted by animals in the surrounding water, the shark can hone in on its prey. The great white can travel up to 56 kilometers per hour. This speed is assisted by their torpedo-like body and endothermic nature. Another amazing fact about the white shark is that it's warm-blooded. We think of these animals as being cold-blooded, but a great white shark is quickly into action because it doesn't have to warm its muscles up. So you've got this lovely great big triangular dorsal fin, and then you've got the engine at the back, which is the tail fin doing that, and that's sort of driving it forward, and then the two wings at the side. And uh, when you see a shark moving through the water, you're looking at something of incredible beauty and grace and power and incredible evolution, because it didn't get that by accident. Fish which have the capability of warming their muscles, such as tuna and the shortened mako shark, are often faster and can sustain a higher swim speed in order to migrate great distances. The cetaceans, the dolphins, the whales, all that whole group of animals, um, they're relatively easy for, for science to record in terms of numbers and, and, and things like that because they've got to pop up for air. Unfortunately, sharks, and one of the reasons they got into such terrible trouble is it's a bit sort of out of sight, out of mind. Sharks don't pop up for air. And so because they're not air breathing, they're much, much more difficult to know how many there are. A shark's respiratory system works much like many other of their marine relatives. As a shark swims, water passes through their mouth and is pushed through their gills. The gills filter the oxygen out of the water and into the shark's bloodstream. Great whites do do a curious thing. 
Great whites do a thing called spy hopping, which is normally uh, seen in whales, and that's the poking the head up to have a look around. And as far as I know, it's the only spy, uh, shark species that does it. I've been on shark boats many times when I worked in South Africa as a volunteer, and you'll suddenly see an animal, uh, I call it great whites animals, you'll suddenly see the shark pop up beside the boat and, and have a look around. Um, whether or not it's responding to the stimulus of the chum in the water, I don't know. Um, I certainly think that's, that's making it more curious, um, but they are the only shark species that spy hop, which is normally what whales do. When hunting, you really see the, the great white sort of physique coming to its own in terms of the speeds achievable. So you, you imagine a surfer, or, or no, a surfer, a seal on the surface of the water. So the shark's down there. Now, great white sharks are capable of breaching completely. That means the whole body length out of the water. So you've got this animal down there and it's swimming along and it sees something up there. And to get its whole body out of the water, it's gonna have to achieve a speed of over 30 miles an hour. So it's gonna charge up to the surface and whack and come out of the water at over 30 miles an hour. The normal sort of uh, cruising speed is very, very slow. You'll see them just, just, just literally cruising along at one, two miles an hour, I would guess. Uh, a sort of normal, perhaps, hunting speed, or maybe about 20 miles an hour, when it's actually going for something. But when it's breaching, or when it's charging at something from underneath, that's what's been recorded, over 30 miles an hour. And when you consider that the, the size of Great White, this is an animal that gets up to over five meters in length, recorded up to six meters in length. To get that body out of the water, that's a lot of power. From Latin, the Great White's name is translated to Ragged Tooth, a fitting name given that the shark's teeth has always been a significant trait. So behind that tooth is another tooth and another tooth, and it's like a production line. And a white shark has probably got, I think, about 300 teeth uh, in its mouth in operation at any one time. 50,000, I believe, teeth likely in a lifetime. Now, of course, that depends how long the lifetime is. But I, I guess that when they arrive at a figure like that, they're probably talking about an average animal, maybe 40, 45 years or something like that. One of the reasons there are so many great white shark teeth found on, on the seabed, and there are so many fossils, is because they're shedding them the whole time. And that actually does apply to most predatory shark species. But when a shark's going for its prey, so you've got the upper jaw, if you like, and then a lower jaw sitting at that sort of thing. So that doesn't really work, does it? in terms of closing your mouth. So what the, what's got to happen is the lower jaw dislocates slightly and comes into line, and then it works. So they can do that. They can kind of unhinge their jaw as they're going in to, to attack their prey species. By eating fish, they play a vital role in benefiting marine ecosystems, creating balance in the food chain. One of the reasons that sharks are, um, great white sharks in particular, I suppose, interact so unfortunately with humans as often as they do, which isn't really very often, is because they, they often mistake humans for what they really want to eat. And what they really want to eat uh, are seals. That would be the, the number one item on the menu. And that's why you find white sharks in South Africa where there are seal colonies. In uh, California, where there are seal colonies. In Australia, where there are seal colonies. One of the fascinating um, facts for Britons, actually, is that we've got a pretty massive seal population going up the west side of Britain, and particularly right off the, uh, off the northwest of Scotland. Huge seal population, but we don't seem to have any white sharks. But seals would be number one. Uh, menu item and then anything you know uh, smaller fish smaller sharks one of the things that's happening to, to white sharks is, is that their prey list is going down because it's being overfished the whole time so the smaller shark species are not there in the abundance they once were if, if a shark is going to mistake a, a human on a surfboard for a seal then you know it knows very quickly that it's made a mistake. So you've got this animal rushing up from underneath and bam, because it's got no hands or feet to feel you with, so it's got to use its mouth. So it uses its mouth, it makes an exploratory bite. 
Now, if it's a great white shark, an exploratory bite is likely to be quite a horrific affair. But nevertheless, as soon as it realizes that it's got a mouthful of yuck, you know, it doesn't, it just got, it's got sinew and bone and surfboard and wetsuit. That's not attractive when it thought it was getting a lovely juicy seal. So it, exploratory bite lets you go and then hopefully you get treated very quickly and you survive. Without hands and with the possibility of their vision being blocked by ocean sediments, a shark uses its next best thing in its arsenal to investigate potential food sources, its mouth. Many misinterpret a shark bite to be malicious. Rather, the shark is trying to understand what is present in the surrounding area. Some sharks may be docile, having little to no interest in its surroundings. Some, however, are more active and unpredictable, a natural mood for a hungry fish. Great whites are probably separated from all the other sharks by their reputation. And, and that's kind of unfair, really because we've got, say, 15 to 20 dangerous sharks out of 500 and something. When I say dangerous, these are sharks that have been recorded having uh, interactions with man, classified as attacks. So the white shark is, is top of the tree, but I'm not sure that's fair because it's highly likely that the bull shark may be responsible for more attacks than the white shark. Uh, an awful lot of this happens because in some water situations, in estuaries, for example, the bull shark can take fresh water and salt water. So the bull shark can go up estuaries. Now in relatively primitive places, particularly in the third world, if they're washing, swimming, bathing, etc., in muddy water in estuaries, uh, and a bull shark comes and takes them, you don't stop and identify the shark. You know, you just get bitten and then, and then why? So, so an awful lot of attacks I suspect that may have been attributed to white sharks in the past um, were, were actually likely to be bull sharks. One of the things I hate answering when I'm lecturing, especially young children, uh, is, is what's the difference between a male and a female shark? And I know the children when they're asking this question, when they already know the answer when they ask the question, because what they're asking about is why do male sharks have two willies? And that can be really embarrassing if you're the person giving the lecture and you've got 200 children out there having been primed this question. Um, but males reproduce and they're called claspers, so males have two claspers. They get calcified. Um, I don't quite know why they have two. I don't think the science actually knows that yet. But so fr from a reproduction point of view, it's a very mammalian almost situation. You have a clasper inserted into the female. When uh, reproduction's going on, the male will uh, grab the female. It's pretty brutal sometimes, because if you think about it, they, they can't hold, they can't embrace. I mean, it's, it's a mouth that grabs a female. I've seen blue sharks with horrific scarring down their back, where a male's grabbed a female and then sort of twisted around her, and, and so on and so forth. History has cast a shark in a very unfortunate place. Uh, and the casting of a shark in that sort of dimension of fear hasn't really been helped by things like Jaws, the movie, which I actually happen to think was a brilliant movie. The 1975 film, Jaws, directed by Steven Spielberg, was by all accounts a technical and narrative marvel. The film featured a group of fishermen who sought to hunt down a great white shark which had fatally attacked some swimmers prior. <laughs> Upon release, the public perception on sharks had changed for the worse. In a heartbeat, the fish was demonized. The shark was now known as a bloodthirsty creature which only seeks to kill, the devil reincarnate. What came next was devastating to shark life. The impact Jaws had on the human psyche led to a term being called the Jaws effect. An irrational fear of sharks became prevalent and even promoted by the media. More films and TV shows would follow always depicting sharks in a negative light and steadily strengthening the fear that people have of the fish. 
Films such as The Shallows and The Meg are some of the many which have fallen victim to the Jaws effect. In an effort to inform the misconceptions about sharks, the series Shark Week has been established to promote shark conservation. However, the hatred of this fish has become global. Shark attacks would be pushed to the media forefront, when in reality, these attacks were extremely scarce and on many occasions provoked. So for most people, there is, yes, just fear. It's, it's a sort of one-dimensional view of the shark. Increasingly, in recent years, and I'm really, really thrilled about this, the shark is being seen as the victim rather than the threat. People are beginning to realize that sharks are being way overfished. For many, many, many years, their fins were sliced off to end up in bowls of fin soup. And to give you an idea of this, I was doing some, uh, some vox pops down in the street in Richmond about 12 years ago. Um, with a presenter called Miranda Krestovnikov, and we were trying to find people in the street to give us a stereotype answer of what sharks meant to them. We wanted shock, horror, fear. It was really a struggle. We were saying, asking people what they thought about sharks, and they were saying, oh, you must understand, you know, sharks are, are being overfished, sharks are being killed, the real threat is not sharks to humans, it's humans to sharks, which was great news. It was fantastic, because our message was getting across. I would say, the shark will always struggle to lose its image of, of fear, of attack. It's just the word. In parts of China, Taiwan, and Southeast Asia, shark fin soup has been a delicacy since the 1300s. The process of finning involves capturing the fish, slicing off the shark's fin, and dumping the rest of the still living body back into the ocean. The fins themselves became high-value targets due to their monetary and cultural value. Shark finning was banned in Europe in 2003, following a UK campaign to conserve the frighteningly endangered species. The finning process is also outlawed in all high-sea tuna fisheries within eastern countries such as China, although shark fins still continue to be collected and exported throughout many different countries. Sharks have a very low reproduction rate, so will commonly produce very few pups. A great white shark, for example, typically might produce between three, maybe seven, eight, nine, maximum maybe 10 pups. Uh, and this doesn't happen very often. This look, I, think the, I think the gestation period for a, a white shark is about eight or nine months. I could, um, so low production rate, so very, very, very um, susceptible to being overfished. So you start taking too many of these animals out and they don't sexually mature until I think females are about, I think females are about 14, males are about 12. So very difficult for shark populations to take a lot of fishing pressure. Um, and certainly through the 90s, the early part of this century, when shark fins were being harvested at an absolutely obscene rate, you know, not, not a million, not two million, tens of millions of fins a year just being sliced off. Uh, to end up in, in bowls of, frankly, rather tasteless soup. And the reason that sort of started happening was because of the, the huge growth in, in, in the Chinese population that could afford the luxuries. Uh, so suddenly it wasn't just the, you know, the, the Communist Politburo or the top guys who could afford this stuff, it was the middle class who suddenly had a lot of money. So the whole market went berserk and shark's fin soup went from being something that people dreamt about to something that was people served at their weddings and all sorts of social events. It was a little bit of a sort of a mark of, of having made it. You know, instead of serving caviar, which you might do in, in this society here, serve shark fin soup. And so enormous pressure on sharks. Sharks were harvested hundreds, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, uh, and, and it really does show. I mean, I've visited various places in the world where there are no sharks. Liz Downey, maritime expert at the London Aquarium, says sharks are being slaughtered so fast, soon there won't be any left to fish. At the moment, the, the trade is so unsustainable that it will end up that we will no longer have a fishing trade for sharks if we carry on, and it may have more devastating effects than that in actually resulting in um, extinction of some species. It is the shark's fin, the mere sight of which is enough to cause terror, that threatens to be its downfall. A trip down London's Chinatown quickly shows the reason why. Across the world, particularly in Asian communities, there's an insatiable appetite for shark's fin soup 
and other traditional recipes made from the fin of the killer fish. Environmentalists say we should care about the shark because it does a good job, feeding on weak and sick fish, maintaining nature's balance in the oceans. They insist its evil reputation is largely undeserved. Since the 1970s, the shark population saw a decline like no other. By 2024, over 71% of biomass has been overfished. Each year, over 100 million sharks are killed. There has been a 79% drop in the great white family, an 80% drop in thresher sharks, and a 99% drop in bull sharks, dusky sharks, smooth hammerheads, and poor beagle sharks. I grew up in the, in, in, in the Gulf, in, in, in Kuwait and Bahrain and, and places like that, and uh, sharks were in our lives all the time. I then led about six shark expeditions to the Gulf looking for sharks, and we chummed, so we put stuff in the water to attract sharks, for over 400 hours, and we only had one large predatory shark, one. We found lots of dead sharks in the markets, so we were able to study our sharks, and from a scientific perspective, the thing worked in that respect, but that just shows you the extraordinary rate of depletion in that particular piece of water, because when, when I was a kid growing up in the Gulf, sharks were there literally all the time. It's a treat to see a shark, and it's almost unheard of now to see a big shark. You're normally seeing small black tips and small reef sharks and things like that. Um, so all over the world, I'm afraid, massively depleted. And with a species like the great white shark, um, we don't have any idea how many there are. Uh, they're probably, probably much more depleted even than something like lions. You read figures with the white shark of between uh, three and a half thousand and five thousand uh, animals in the whole planet. I mean, that's frightening stuff. Of course, they don't breathe air like sort of dolphins, whales, and this, that, and the other, so more difficult to count. I mean, more difficult to get an idea of populations. But we do know the population is massively depleted. Sharks are now going extinct at an alarming rate. After the release of Jaws, more fishermen became obsessed over showing their ability to kill sharks. By taking a small boat out onto the water, or simply fishing from the shore, catching sharks as large as 500 pounds was possible with a reasonably sized rod and reel. Alongside people fishing on their own, people began to sponsor tournaments to initiate organized shark fishing for prizes. The death of a shark was celebrated. I guess the great, great white story today is that they are not top of the ocean tree. They're generally reckoned by, by most people to be the sort of most fierce and most dreaded thing in the ocean. Great whites themselves in South Africa are now being taken out by killer whales. This has obviously gone on forever, but there's two particular killer whales that seem to have uh, decided to, to attack great whites, and they're being copied by, by other killer whales. And the best place in the world to see great white sharks used to be a place called Hansby in South Africa, an offshore Hansby's dire island, and that you had a 95% chance of, of seeing a great white if you went there. And if you were a tourist, it was amazing, because you could get there in sort of a, an hour from shore, uh, and, and then you'd be in the water with, with a great white shark. They have disappeared. Two killer whales rocked up, and they're nicknamed port and starboard, because one has a, a fin that flops that way, the other has a fin that flops that way, uh, hence their nicknames. And they've worked out how to hunt cooperatively, and they've just decided or started to take out great whites in this stretch of ocean. And every time there is an orca predation on the white sharks, the sharks skedaddle. They just get out of town. I always call it Shark City. And it's a dying town now, in the sense that the big draw's gone, because the big draw's been taken out by a bigger predator. Orcas will hunt cooperatively. And so uh, if you've got a white shark swimming along and it's been targeted, one orca's highly likely to come and whack it from underneath, kind of charge it, hit it. And then the shark will, will go belly up and will go uh, into a sort of suspended state. And you very often then just see the, the white belly there. and. What, it, what the orcas want is the liver. 
which is sort of, if this is the shark's belly, the liver's in here. And so you get a very neat little, almost surgical slit there, and the liver's been removed. And that's all that these guys eat. They just want the liver. So they take the liver, they don't chew the rest of the shark, the rest of the shark's intact. Uh, they just take the liver and off they go. That's, that's all they want. It's full of incredible nutrients, lots and lots and lots, packed full of vitamins and minerals, and that's what the orcas must be targeting. Our oceans are now faced with three huge threats, overfishing, pollution, and climate change. And nature is facing a breaking point. Thanks to the food and oxygen it provides, the seas are integral to the survival of humanity, but it must be maintained. Humans have mismanaged the waters, pollution has increased, and by 2050, it is estimated there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. For me, one of the big challenges is dispelling the myth. So here we've got these, this, this group of animals which really are suffering from a, an undeserved reputation. Very few shark attacks, and yet they've got this dreadful label on them. And I can't get rid of it, and all the campaigners like me, we can't get rid of it. So why? It's really, it's really interesting to speculate why. If you go back into ancient Roman and Greek mythology, and you see naval battles depicted at sea, You'll see guys being shot off ships with bows and arrows and spears and stuff like that. And very often you'll see sharks depicted in the water waiting for them to fall overboard. So right back in Greek and Roman times, these animals were, were being demonized in this way. I often wonder whether Jonah and the whale shouldn't actually be Jonah and the white shark, the great white shark, because very few whales will take a human in. Very few whales have got the structure to do that. But a six meter great white shark certainly could do that. Perhaps one of the most famous incidents was the, uh, a ship called the SS Indianapolis. And the Indianapolis was an American ship which went to an island off Japan at the end of the Second World War, and they delivered the atomic bombs that were then put on airplanes and taken and dropped uh, on Japan. And the Indianapolis, having delivered the bombs, got torpedoed. 1,300, 1,400 men went into the water. And they stayed in the water for three or four days or something before survivors were picked up. And only three or four hundred, something like that, came out. The rest were either died of exposure or, or injuries or something, or were taken by sharks. And that was famously described in, in the film Jaws. But the SS Indianapolis incident cemented the great white shark as a sort of uh, hate figure, fear figure, at the end of the Second World War. And it was very, very widely um, publicized. Jaws, of course, didn't really help. But I think the main thing is that we've got this sort of, this deep-seated fear of, of the unknown. So why are we more frightened of sharks, for example, than lions? It's completely illogical. Um, you've got probably far more chance with a shark than with a lion. I'll tell you why. It's because it hits the fear buttons. The fear of the unknown. The fear of being eaten alive. The fear of being out of your own element. And if you think about the film Jaws, and that incredible opening scene, which is so clever with the, with the, with the girls swimming and being attacked, all three human fear buttons are hit. So it's the unknown. The camera comes up through the water and, and the shark takes the girl. So she's being attacked by this hidden monster from the unknown, from underneath. She's then going to be eaten, so that's the second fear button. And of course, she's in the shark's element, not her own element, she's in the water. So that, I don't know if Benchley knew what he was doing when he wrote that or whether Spielberg knew when he was doing when he constructed the scene, but he hit all three human fear buttons and humans from that point in the theatre were absolutely captivated by that. And that, in general terms, is it, I think. It hits the fear buttons. And the other thing is, we must remember, we love our monsters. Go to any, any fairground you like in Britain or the United States or anywhere, and we've got the house of horrors, the wall of death, the this, the that, the other. Do you ever see a house of lovely things? Do you ever see wall of survival? 
uh, do you ever see, you know, no, 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 it's got to be horror, it's got to be this, that and the other. The shark hits all those buttons as well. So the poor old shark really, I can struggle as hard as I can and, and we all try and do with people like me, but it's got an awfully big uphill struggle because it's got to get rid of history and get rid of sort of really primal fear. Disrupting the flow of the ecosystem disrupts the planet's progress. By killing sharks, humans have continued to risk a hugely negative change in nature, which will go on to affect our quality of life. The extinction of sharks would lead to economic instability, fisheries would collapse, and coral reefs would suffer more than they are currently. The ocean waters would become warmer, more acidic, and hold less oxygen. The sea levels would change, altering the landscapes of coastlines around the globe. Eventually, any creature which would be left would not be of use to us, such as jellyfish, which would become far more prominent in the waters. Many of the problems which threaten the longevity of the ocean are far bigger than the choices of an individual. There must be large-scale collective change in the way the seas and habitats are maintained. Such devotion requires the involvement of governments and businesses. It would be difficult to overstate the degree to which the oceans are in trouble. And if we look at sharks, they are apex predators. So they're the top of the food chain. And when you remove a link in a chain, the chain collapses. So sharks play a hugely important part in keeping our oceans healthy. And if we want to continue to exist on this planet as humans, we need healthy oceans for our continued healthy existence. It's not the only answer, but we need sharks in those oceans to keep them healthy. For years and years and years now, decades, sharks have been overfished, over-persecuted, over-harvested, often way past the point that their populations can sustain. And because sharks reproduce so slowly, they, they haven't been able to keep up with the pressure that's being put on them. One good thing that has started to happen in recent years, I think, is that the publics all over the world have started to appreciate sharks, um, not just as sort of dread machines of attack, um, but, but as the beautiful creatures they are. There's been a lot of pressure on governments here in Europe uh, and in the United States to put sort of legislation in place to protect shark populations and protect the oceans in general. So I'm hopeful as we go forward now that, that sharks do have a future. If you'd asked me that question uh, 15, 20 years ago, I would have, um, I'd have been a lot less sure. But we've now got a policy in Europe, for example, called FNA, Fins Naturally Attached. Sharks may be landed, unless they're protected species, they may be landed and the fin must be attached to the shark. So there's no more slicing off of fins at sea, dumping the body and just taking all, all, the, all the fins in. And that used to happen because the fins were the valuable bit. It's very, very similar to taking a domestic animal, let's say a dog or a cat, chopping its feet off and leaving it on the pavement. All that is now uh, being stopped. Hasn't totally been stopped, but it is being stopped. So we've grown up, we've done all that, that's good. In China, uh, which used to consume 90%, no, I believe 95% of the world's shark fins, China is now consuming a lot less. The Chinese government has stopped shark fin soup being served at official banquets and things like that. Young people in China, due to the power of the internet, they don't want their parents to buy them shark fin soup at their weddings. So there is hope. There have to be hope. Sharks are not the bloodthirsty predators we have been led to believe for so many years. They are an intelligent, curious species. Whilst the quantity of shark attacks range around the 70s per year in the past two decades, it should also be noted that a very small amount of attacks are fatal. In fact, in 2022, there were 11 deaths caused by fireworks and five by shark attacks. Other more dangerous animals include mosquitoes, dogs, and even cows. If you live in a country where there are lots of cows, and this is a slightly unfair statistic because, you know, if you, if you live in a rural situation, you're not going to be going to the ocean anyway. But there will be more deaths as a result of accidents with cows than with sharks. It's, I feel very sorry for sharks because they've got so much more to fear from us than we have from them.
I want to put the whole shark attack thing in a little bit of context. We've got over 500 species of sharks and we're still discovering more. Less than 20 have been recorded attacking man. So it's a tiny proportion. So out of the tiny proportion that attack man, if you're being approached by a shark in the water, there are some things you do, but there are basically things you, I would say, more that you don't do. Uh, women would be stupid to go in the water if they were menstruating. You don't pee in the water. Urine's just as exciting, gives up just as much of a smell as, as, as blood or something else. So you avoid all that. Avoid shiny, flashy silver objects because these sorts of things can not only attract the shark's attention, but might look like a fish. If you're a surfer, don't go surfing where you know there are white sharks on patrol, because there is a possibility you'll be mistaken for a seal. So it's kind of common sense, really. Make yourself uh, as large as possible, and that, that's true of any predator. Most predators are ambush or chase predators, and a shark is no different. On the occasions where I've felt slightly threatened, I've always made myself as big as possible spread arms, spread legs, big camera in my hand sometimes, etc., to make myself a bigger animal th th than I am. A way of avoiding an attack by something that was really maybe thought you were a threat to a food source, for example, would be to do exactly the opposite. I'm no threat, so, so do that. There are various techniques and you learn them, basically. Most divers should actually learn about this sort of thing, and surfers certainly should learn about this sort of thing. The vast majority of victims who are attacked by sharks survive. The majority of fatalities are due to blood loss, indicating the shark does not persist to eat the person as pop culture has it. Perhaps the most famous great white shark is an animal called Nicole, named after Nicole Kidman, uh, who had a, a real sort of passion for, 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 for great white sharks. And Nicole was tagged off South Africa with a satellite tag. And the satellite tag then transmits data up, up, to, up to a satellite, and eventually the data comes down, you can see where the animal's gone. And satellite tags are set to pop off after a certain period of time. So Nicole was tagged in South Africa, and then the tag popped off an ocean away in Western Australia, 90 odd days later. She had made a whole ocean crossing and the most amazing things about this were that she knew where she was going. The satellite track showed she had more or less gone in a straight line. Now, any of us humans, we need a GPS, we need a compass, we need this, we need that, we need the other. We haven't got a clue. We can't even go from sort of London and England to Scotland without help. A great white shark can do a whole ocean and it's all in there somehow. And, and how did she do it? Well, we, we don't know is the answer, but she's got this electrosensory array in her snout, so she may well have picked up electromagnetic clues from the Earth's core, because she did dive down to deep distances as well as staying near the surface most of the time. Maybe she was using stellar clues, uh, in other words, navigating by the stars, because they do spy hop. She was within 20 feet of the surface an awful lot of the time, but with pretty much pinpoint accuracy, she knew where she was going. And then the most amazing thing is, uh, she turned around and came back. And then later the following year, she turned up literally a couple of hundred meters away from where she'd been tagged in South Africa. Uh, so, you know, she's gone there all that distance. And I think I'm right in saying the total distance was plus or minus 20,000 kilometers. But Nicole was, was more than just, just an ocean voyager. She proved that white sharks do that. So she proved that there's no point in having protection for the white shark here in South Africa and protection for the white shark here in Australia if they do that in the middle. So she really did help the scientists get protection for white sharks across ocean spaces rather than just in national waters. So she, she broke the mold in an awful lot of ways. Um, sadly, we, we don't really know what happened to her. So I actually wrote a book called Nicole about her. Um, a friend of mine, I think the scientist who was involved, was, was very much in love with Nicole. If it's impossibly in love with the shark, he was in love with a great white shark. And it's, I was in love at second hand with her. Uh, and when it came to writing the book, because we don't know what's happened to Nicole, I thought, well, how do I finish it? I can be proved wrong. 
you know. Um, so I had her in a sort of death-defying situation, which she probably escapes from, but you'd have to read the book and make up your own mind. White sharks um, have been recorded living up to, we think, probably about 60, 65 uh, years old. Uh, you know, may, may, maybe big specimens uh, more. Uh, it's very unusual today because they've been so overfished to see the really big specimens. I mean, in the probably, I was going to say hundreds, I probably haven't seen hundreds of white sharks because you tend to see the same ones again. Come, but, but tens of white sharks, certainly. I've only ever seen three or four that have been five meters or, or over. Um, so very few of them are getting to the kind of lengths uh, that they would be if they're going to achieve that sort of that sort of age, uh, maximum of the 60 year. In order to stop the demonization of these beautiful creatures, we must first appreciate that for hundreds of millions of years, the sea has been their home, not ours. The generations following our own should be taught that sharks are not monsters. They are in fact much like us, operating to survive in an unforgiving climate. And it is up to us to see that these magnificent life forms continue to thrive for many years to come. And one of the great things I would say is, um, you know, do regard your natural world as worth preserving. Because if you don't, the planet won't preserve you. And do regard sharks as, as something of incredible beauty uh, and something to be admired uh, and sought after. Go, go and try and see them. If you don't want to get in the water with them, don't. Stay on the boat and look down uh, into the water. But, but in enjoy nature and enjoy your sharks. And let's everything on the planet, let's try and live together. Let's try and have a future, all of us.